Let's talk some chess. This game features the greatest dynasty in chess history. I think you'll know what we mean when we get to that point. It was played in 1915 in Moscow. The player with the white pieces, very famous former world champion Alexander Elyekin. The player with the black pieces, unfortunately, does not have a name in the database, which is sad because of this game's historical stature. But in any case, we start off with e4 from Elyekin. Um, we have uh, e6 uh, with black pieces and d4, so uh, the opening moves in the French defense. Uh, d5, continuing with the French defense, and knight to c3. Uh, again, the main line, this is still played today, uh, so sort of they had a handle on this thing even back in 1915. Uh, knight to f6 and bishop to f g5 immediately, pinning the knight to the queen, so a nice principled move to get the bishop um, uh, already pinning one of these uh, great pieces in the center, which is attacking the pawn on e4, and obviously you have to worry about this because the knight and the pawn are attacking e4, and it's only defended once by the knight on uh, c3, so uh, putting the bishop here eliminates one of those attackers in principle, because obviously if the knight moves, then you get to pick up the queen. So um, that's the idea there, uh, and uh, the player with the black pieces is the same sort of idea. Bishop to b4, now eliminating the defender of this e4 pawn by pinning the knight to the king. And this is a much more strict pin because you literally cannot move this knight away uh, by the rules of chess. You can sacrifice your queen if you want to, um, but you cannot move your knight away from uh, the king. So anyways, I don't know why I'm getting so detailed into this, the opening of the French defense. Uh, we have much more exciting things to talk about in this game. Uh, so e5 was played because e4 was under threat of being captured by the pawn on, uh, on d5. And uh, this looks like a very, uh, I mean, this looks like a great combo because um, the pawn is attacking the knight, which is pinned to the queen. So it looks like you just want a knight, um, but now you get h6. So this is the, you know, you know, essentially what, what black allowed here is if the pawn takes the knight, then the pawn takes the bishop and all is fine and all is well, um, or so we think. Uh, so uh, here we have pawn takes knight, um, and really th the best move here is to take the bishop. But now you get pawn takes on g7. And this is the start of just a tumultuous series of moves that leads to one of the most ridiculous configurations I've seen on a chessboard. Um, this pawn, obviously, on g7 is threatening the rook on h8. The only, like, the only move you can do here is rook to g8, you know, blocking and attacking the pawn. Um, if you put the rook anywhere else, like, let's say you even try to lift the rook on the h-file, then the pawn promotes to a queen, and it's a very sad day. And you obviously cannot move the rook to f8, because then pawn takes rook on f8. So the only move you can play here is rook to g8, um, and now h4. Uh, so inching this other pawn up closer uh, to this pawn on... Uh, um, uh, on g7. Uh, we have g takes on h4. Instead of taking with the rook on g7, we have g takes on h4. That, that'll that be important later. Um, and now queen to g4. So uh, you couldn't play queen to g4 in this position because it would be blocked. If you play queen to g4 here, you just get rook takes and that's no good. So instead, uh, h4 threatening to create um, another pass pawn on the h file. And here, uh, black just eliminates that. But then you get this queen to g4 move. Um, protecting uh, this very valuable passed pawn on g7. And here, uh, black plays bishop to e7, um, and this is another sort of uh, kind of decision in the series of decisions that leads to the craziness of this game. Here you need to, uh, the, the idea behind this move is that you're protecting your passed pawn, or not passed pawn, but you're protecting your pawn on the h file. Um, black here is worried that maybe Al Aliakin wants to pick up this pawn with uh, the rook and the queen, and, and now by putting the bishop on e7, the bishop and the queen defend this pawn on h4, so the, the pawn is safe. But what you need to do here is worry less about attacking with your pawn and more about defending by removing this pawn on g7. So the proper move here is queen to f6, and it's kind of a crazy line, so we're just gonna, I'm just going to show you sort of how it goes. Uh, now you have the queen and the rook attacking this pawn on g7. So here you get uh, rook takes on f4, a nice rook lift, and this is what you know black was trying to prevent, was the rook taking the pawn. Um, knight to uh, uh, e6, developing a piece, and now rook to h7. So um, making sure this pawn is really solid here on, on g7. But now you get knight to d4, and now these two, you know, the, the knight and the bishop are getting close to the enemy king, um, and you can't pick up the knight with the queen because the black queen is protecting here. So here you have to castle king side to sort of get the king to safety, um, but now bishop takes on c3, messing up uh, the pawn structure for Aliakin on the queen side. Uh, pawn takes, and now knight to f5, uh, and now there are three pieces attacking uh, this past pawn, and, and there's no real way to defend it. So instead you just get queen to f4, um, pinning the knight to the queen. So now 
Uh, the knight cannot capture the pawn because then uh, the queen will fall. The queen is undefended here on f6. So instead you get queen captures on c3, um, putting the queen in a very dangerous position. Obviously you don't want the queen to get to a1 with check. Um, uh, so here bishop, well, in this case, the uh, Eliakin wouldn't mind, uh, but in theory you don't want that. Uh, bishop to d3, uh, attacking the knight. Um, and here even e5, uh, which is a great move because we'll see it in the main line. Bishop protects the knight here on f5, and now pawn attacks the queen on f4, and the pawn is protected by the black queen, so you can't just capture back with check. So a very nice move. Uh, and here, actually, the, the correct move, and this is just a crazy line. I know I'm going very deep into it, but it's because it's so crazy. Um, we get rook to h8, obviously threatening to pick up the rook with check, and then clear the way for this passed pawn. But you actually ignore that here and play first an intermezzo, queen to uh, a3 with check after the king moves, then pawn takes queen, so sort of a, a queen sacrifice by white, but it's a temporary sacrifice, because then rook uh, takes on f8 with check, king moves to e8, and now rook to e8 with check, after the king picks it up, then you bring a queen into the game on g8, and now black retreats with the queen, um, and you have these two queens next to, each, next to each other on f8 and g8. So that's just a crazy line, that's the, the proper line, this is a equal position for both sides, it's totally fine, um, yeah, it, is, it wouldn't get into any craziness. I mean, it, it's a crazy line for sure, but we wouldn't have seen sort of the craziness that we saw on the board. And that whole sort of line uh, basically would have happened, or, you know, if they had played the correct moves, would have happened if um, you get this queen to f6 move here, which is a little bit more defensive and attacking this passed pawn, uh, which is deep in black's territory. But instead, you get the more aggressive, even though it doesn't look more aggressive, bishop to e7, protecting this pawn on h6. And now this allows us to go down a whole nother rabbit hole um, that starts with g3. So uh, adding another attacker to this pawn on h4. Um, and here, uh, uh, black just says, okay, I'm going to give this up and plays uh, c5, threatening this pawn on d4. And we have g captures on h4. Uh, so uh, kind of, you know, now you've got these two pass pawns and you can sort of see this pawn starting to be threatening and marching up the board. Um, but black does have some counterplay here and takes on d4 and this comes with an attack on the knight on uh, c4. But here Alakine says, no, I've just created these two awesome pass pawns. I'm going to ignore this knight on c3. I don't care about it. I'm going to play h5, which is just a super, super bold move. I mean, like just giving up a piece here. This pawn is getting close to promotion. Um, so just super, super exciting stuff. Uh, we have pawn takes on c3. This isn't the proper move here. The, the correct move, which we saw sort of in the other line, is actually e5. Um, and the nice thing about this move is it maintains the pressure on the knight on c3, um, but you can't move the knight away because the queen is now under attack. There's a discovered attack from the bishop to the queen. So here the queen has to retreat, and then you can take the pawn, um, and then you can, uh, after pawn takes now, you're in a better position with these two central pawns, and the bishop can, can develop. So this is the better idea. But uh, here, black is a little bit impatient and just takes right away on c3. Um, and here, Alakine doesn't take back, just plays h6. So the past two moves, he sacrificed a knight um, and now sacrificed a pawn because black takes on b2. And now we have this crazy symmetry. We have a pawn, uh, a black pawn on b2, a white pawn on g7. Um, and both sides are threatening to queen and promote. And it's just it's just totally crazy. So um, Alyakin has to play rook to b1, just like black had to play rook to g8 to prevent this pawn from marching forward. Um, also, you know, now threatening to capture the pawn. Um, so to prevent that, uh, black here plays queen to a5 with check. Uh, a little intermezzo uh, with the idea of defending this pawn. Uh, king to e2 here, and here the actual, the the proper, um, you know, the right idea here for black is to just repeat, play queen to uh, a6, king goes back, and just to get a perpetual and draw this way. Um, that's the best way in this position, because, uh, let me make sure I get back to the right area, because here Alyakin has these two pass pawns, and they're supported by a queen and a rook, and these are going to be very tough to deal with, and you should just get out while you can and, and take the perpetual. There's no better move. There's no better escape for the white king, so that, that's the way to go. But, you know, just like we saw with this bishop to e7 move, black says, no, I've got a pass pawn on my own. I'm going to counter on my own. I'm going to take Alyakin down, and I'm going to play, after this king to e2, I'm going to play queen captures on a2 instead of going for the perpetual check. And now I'm threatening to pick up the rook, on uh, b1, and no matter what happens, even if the rook moves, I'm queening my pawn on b1 and all, all as well. Um, but the problem is here is that this little h pawn, which started out on g2, um, now gets this h7 move in, and now this rook is just completely toast. 
there are no squares for this sad rook to go without being captured by one of these two pawns. And now you have these two pawns that are threatening to, to promote, um, and, and it's just it's just craziness. So, uh, you know, uh, black continues to ignore this threat because at this point you kind of have to. You kind of have to get, um, it's kind of an arms race now, right? And you need to sort of develop, um, you know, your, your secret weapons. So uh, queen to b1, uh, taking the rook on the b file, and now preparing to move the queen and, and you know, queen... Um, his own pawn. But of course we get the first queening of the game, uh, the game, the H pawn takes the rook. So in case you missed that, pawn takes rook, turns into a queen. This comes with check. Um, and you can't block with the bishop, which is why this pawn is so nice, because if, if you block with the bishop, then you just get another queen into the game. So the king moves to d7. And now queen takes on uh, f7, clearing the other queening square for the other pawn. So we have these two queens, we have this rook, and we have another pawn ready to be queened. And again, Alyekin is not doing anything about the pawn on b2 because he's like, I'm not worried. I've got two queens and a third to come. So we get queen takes on c2 with check. Uh, the king has to move. Um, and now we get, first we get this knight to c6 move, which is a, a good move. You know, it looks like you just want to put another queen into the game quickly, but you kind of have to get this knight out and, and protect this uh, bishop and... Um, <laughs> The other nice thing about that I like about this knight is what's uh, yeah. It, let's say let's say Alyakin just makes like a silly move here, um, not a silly move, but promoting a queen. Then this knight has like the most mega royal fork that you have ever seen. It's forking the king. It's checking the king and it's forking two queens, which is just like the most insane thing I've ever seen. So um, would have been nice to see this on the board. This like super mega fork, but we didn't. Alyakin obviously sees this and instead he plays uh, he plays queen takes. Uh, he plays G queen takes, which you don't usually have to say, but you have to specify which queen it is. G queen takes on E6, uh, and this obviously checks the black king. So the black king moves to uh, C7, but now you have discovered attack from the bishop to uh, one of the queens. Um, he, yeah, discovered attack from the bishop to one of the queens, which, which is great. Um, so here, uh, Al Yakin continues the attack with queen to F4 check, um, and now uh, the king moves to uh, B6, where it is relatively safe. Here you get queen again, queen e. You have to specify which queen. Queen e to e3, preparing to well, this this comes with check and obviously preparing to attack on the queen side. Um, and now bishop blocks on uh, c5. So now the bishops are doing a good job, sort of uh, protecting the king and sort of fending off these just monsters here that are uh, threatening to checkmate the enemy king. Um, so now finally, uh, Alyekin has time to get his third queen into the game, as if these two weren't enough, and he plays uh, g8 with a promotion to a queen. You know, he's worried about bishop takes queen here on e3, so why not bring another queen up? But now this allows for the fifth and final queen of the game to be promoted. So we have pawn to, to b1, promoting to a queen. And, I, you know, I challenge you to see, like, more than... Honestly, more than like two queens, through seeing three queens in like a high level game is crazy. Seeing four is insane and seeing five is just totally unprecedented. I have never seen this in a game with, you know, excellent players and um, we're like, it, no crazy mistakes have been made. It's just been, um, yeah, it's, it's not like someone like blundered terribly. It's just a cool game where we get to this position and, and you can imagine how this is like a different sport, right? Like it's not even real chess, like these, this, these pieces are so powerful. It's an open board. It's so hard to calculate attacking and defensive chances. And just, you know, we're thankful that we get, you know, we get to watch this game. And I'm sorry, I feel like I'm gushing over this game, but it's just so cool um, that this happened on a chessboard. So anyways, uh, now we have Rook to H6. And if you watch Agon uh review of this game, which I'll, I'll link below, he calls this H6. I, I forget what he calls it, but he, he basically talks about it um, as an awesome move because it is. Um, here you have three queens and... You know, you want to use those queens. You want to generate an attack. You're so excited to have three queens that you can move. Um, but the best move here and the most important move is to ignore those queens and play rook to h6. And this move is important because it pins the knight to the king. Um, and that's important because this knight could has the potential to be a very good defensive piece, as we will see as we continue. So, you know, a, a very non-selfish move by Alyekin, ignoring these three queens, uh, these super powerful trio of queens, and just playing rook to h6. But we'll see why that's important in a moment. And by the same token, so this is sort of where it all flips, Alyekin um, is, you know, unselfish and moves a rook. Here, uh, uh, black is a little bit too materialistic and plays queen takes on f1. Uh, picking up the bishop and trying to even the material. But in a game with five queens, you cannot be materialistic. You have to go for the attack or go for the defense or not worry about picking up a bishop on f1 and essentially taking this queen out of the game. 
The proper move here is actually bishop to g4 um, with check. And this looks like a, just a terrible bishop sacrifice, but it opens up a discovered attack from the rook to the queen. Um, so here you have to capture back with the queen on g8. Um, and the nice thing about this is it gets this queen off of g8 where it had very good attacking chances, which it does, and we'll see. And now you can take the queen on e3 with the bishop after queen takes with check, queen blocks, and you just trade down into a relatively normal game. And here, Al Yekin is still up a bishop, but uh, you have two pawns for that bishop, and this is much more normal and much more okay. So uh, th that's how you should sort of work this. But instead, black goes for uh, the bishop, and again, you know, a lesson that maybe you will never have like applied in your games, but if there are five queens on the board, don't be super materialistic. Worry about the the kings. Uh, that's you know that's what's important in this case, um, because now Yakin has an unstoppable attack, and he starts it with queen to b4 check. Um, and here you can see the importance of this rook to h6 move. The knight would love to take this queen on b4, but it cannot because the rook is pinning it. Same with this bishop on uh, c5. It's pinned by the second queen on e3, so the king is forced to move um, and or, or block with another queen. So we get queen uh, to <laughs> another queen. Queen to b5, blocking the queen. But now we see the importance of the queen on g8. We saw why it was so important in the other line to deflect that queen from g8 because now you get sort of this back rank check, queen to e8 check or d8 check, obviously checking the black king. And again, the, the knight would love to capture this queen, but it's pinned by the rook to the king, so that doesn't work. The king has to move uh, to the a file, but now you get uh, queen e to a3 uh, with check. Again, we have to specify which queen because there are multiple. So the queen is checking the king. The other queen is slicing this way. The other queen is, is taking the a5 square in case it, it mattered at all. And again, you know, you wish you could block here with the knight, but you can't because the rook is uh, is pinning it. So you have to block with the queen. Uh, you have to block with the queen from c2 on a4, and then queen takes, queen takes, queen takes, and this finally is checkmate. Um, and again, it's checkmate because this knight cannot block because of the rook pinning it, um, and it's checkmate because of the queen uh, on the eighth rank cutting off the b6 square. So awesome, awesome game. You know, I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Obviously, it's just insane to see that many queens on the board, um, and it's you know it's, I'm sure it's hard for the engine. It's hard for us to just visualize like what you're supposed to do in this position. But what's so cool and what's kind of a cool dichotomy of this game is yes, it's famous because it has five queens on the board, but probably the coolest and most important move of the game was the rook lift to h6. So chess is full of all those sort of interesting little symmetries. Um, hope you enjoyed that game. Please drop a like, drop a subscribe. If you have any other games you want to talk about, let me know, and we'll see you next time.